policy and interest in, in affecting policy, again, like me, but also an interesting topic for a variety of, of different connections. Uh, obviously, civil servants, there are a lot of them working on pensions, and pensions are a hot topic. Uh, pensions are a major player in the finance industry. So again, understanding of pensions and how they work and what they're supposed to do uh, is a natural integral part of a whole host of different things that you might do with your LSE education. Before launching into the substance, I thought I'd give you a, a brief uh, personal background uh, of how I got uh, into this position. I taught public economics or public finance, uh, as it was then called, for a decade as my major teaching, a variety of other things too, but that was my focus. And not once did I talk about pensions. And then in 1974, I got invited to serve on a small committee for US Congress because they had, Congress had messed up social security badly and they were trying to first of all confirm that it was a mess and secondly, get some advice on what to do. I got hooked on the subject and I worked on and off on US social security from them right up to now but my focus was narrowly US. That changed when communist countries started changing to capitalism. That was one of the really exciting moments to be a research economist because it was a time to learn about many of the fine details of what makes some capitalist economies run better than others. And I watched with growing envy particularly as the macro economists uh, got in, involved in exciting things. And then I realized that the pension systems that had been set up for a communist world would not work for a capitalist world. So I contacted Jeff Sachs, who was organizing a conference, and he was happy to have me get started on this question. Uh, the conference was to be in Poland, so I learned about Polish economists thinking about pension reform and what to do. Uh, and Poland was thinking seriously of imitating what was done in Chile. Uh, so I studied Chile, and then I was off and running uh, and involved with many countries and enjoying the large heterogeneity in pension design across countries and the large variation in how successful they were. Political economy is an integral part of thinking about pensions. Then uh, early uh, in this century, I was invited to be on a panel advising the Chinese government. And so was Nick Ball. And while the panel had, I don't know, half a dozen people on it, uh, the two of us were the two that were really caught up and interested in it. Uh, and we did a report to uh, the Premier Wen Jibao, uh, but we also prepared material to improve the thinking about pensions by the analytic community. And that led us into writing a book, which led us into writing another book, which has led us into working on yet another book. So, Let's get into my actual substance now. Uh, pensions matter a lot. First of all, they're a big part of government budgets. Uh, and as that topic, we're in a world that's changing a lot, particularly driven by aging. So this is a topic that clearly matters a great deal for a lot of people and a lot of governments. And secondly, is one where policy issues are very much alive. So what makes pensions so special? It comes from filling a very important need, which seems to be pretty much widespread. And that is left to their own devices. People save too little 
for their own retirement. Not everyone, obviously, but large fractions of the populace. And in the saving for retirement that they do do or that they're pressed into doing by government policies or employer policies, they often do a rather poor job of accumulating uh, resources for retirement. Mm. So governments widely have stepped in and created mandatory pension systems and have created frameworks for voluntary pension systems, whether organized by employers or individually selected from financial intermediaries. So it is a big topic everywhere for these reasons. And once you have the institution in place from that goal, it becomes a vehicle for addressing other economic issues, uh, such as poverty relief, insurance design, and risk sharing, both within and across cohorts. So all of these come into thinking about what would be good design. So back on the issue of the political saliency, many countries, most uh, advanced countries, have what's referred to as a PAYG or a PAYGO plan. That's one where the contributions or taxes collected to finance the pension each year are primarily used to pay benefits that same year, hence PAYGO, and um, not a reliance as an individual would do for himself of buying financial assets accumulating them, and then figuring out how to use them to finance retirement. So what's happened with aging is overwhelmingly countries have found the systems they had set up, even though the baby boom fertility shock happened a long time ago, countries have been very slow in preparing for what was obviously on the horizon and coming a big increase in retirees as the baby boom generation moves from being a large labor force to being a large retirement group. And so many countries are facing financial shortcomings in their pension system and doing it. But some countries and many firm and individual savings work around a funding basis, that is taking the contributions and using them to buy financial assets and accumulate the assets. Some plans buy government bonds for that. Uh, many plans go into a much more diversified uh, financial aspect and some pension plans look just like sovereign wealth funds in terms of the extraordinary wide range of things that uh, they invest in. So let me say a quick background word. Traditional contribu contributory plans. Contributory plan is a plan people pay taxes for or contributions, and the benefits they get are related to the contributions they've made. Traditionally, there were two types of plan. A defined contribution plan had a rule that said each year you gave X percent of your earnings not all your earnings, earnings up to some limit, to finance the purchase of assets, which would later finance your retirement. A defined benefit plan pays attention either to your contributions or to your earnings that are subject to contributions and has a formula that tells you what kind of monthly benefit you'll get after you retire and that formula will pay as long as you're alive. There may be some survivor benefits or not. And so the benefit comes as a form of an annuity. An annuity is a financial asset that pays while you're alive and stops when you stop being alive, unless you've also combined it with some kind of survivor asset. What's developed over the last few decades are various kinds of hybrid plans that have combinations of both of those. And just in passing, 
uh, countries often have non-contributory plans. That's a plan where uh, the level of benefit you get doesn't depend or doesn't depend importantly on the level of contributions you've made, uh, just your residence or the fact that you've been at work at, at all. So there's a wide variety of plans. And in thinking about plans, you really have to pay attention to um, the pension systems because countries have multiple plans and combine what they're doing with different parts of the different plans. So let me go back to where I was. People don't save enough left to their own devices and people don't do it very well. What, there's a lot of evidence around that and a lot of exploration of the aspects, particularly the behavioral economics aspects uh, that makes that happen. So there's been a significant study of the extent of financial literacy in different parts of the working population in multiple countries in terms of their ability uh, to plan. A typical study will ask a bunch of questions like this one about saving and mark whether the people get the answer right, wrong, or don't answer and overwhelmingly large fractions of people miss out on what seem to uh, academic economists to be very easy questions. The place that they go wrong on this one is they're forgetting compound interest. They're forgetting that the interest in year one also earns interest in year two. And so financial literacy is a problem and that is two things. One is its motivation for having pension plans, both mandates and regulation of voluntary systems. And secondly, it says when you set up a system, insofar as people have choices in the system, and overwhelmingly they do, you have to be very careful about their ability to make good choices. Second thing to keep in mind is the nature of the financial asset market. I've done a lot of work on search theory for a long time. And one of the central elements in search theory is when people are gathering information about alternatives, you will get a distribution of prices out there in the market, even for identical products. So the one study in uh, finance I'm aware of that can work with essentially identical products is a study of S&P 500 index funds. So they're all trying to match the S&P index. They all do pretty well at it, not exactly the same. Uh, they vary in part about the charges they make. And that's what this chart is about. The dark bar is the distribution of charges among funds in the institutional market. The light ones are among funds that are in the individual market. And this is a head count of funds. It's not weighted by how big they are. The weighted one looks rather different because no surprise, the low fund ones tend to have a larger share of the market. So two things come out of this. One is if you're having your pension plan organize your investment for you, they're gonna get lower charges than you can get on your own for much of the population. And the second thing is if you're trying to do it on your own, you're gonna face a great deal of variation in what's out there in the market. Another element that matters here is an S&P 500 index fund is pretty straightforward uh, as a financial asset. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to understand what's going on with a bit of financial sophistication. But financial firms have lots of financial products that 
are designed to help people feel what they perceive to be the financial problem of accumulating assets in a risky world looking toward the future. So the um, study took place to look at this vast array of different products that are out there in the EU. And they asked the following question, the typical product starts by telling you about the rate of return they expect to get from if you buy into this financial product. And it's a high rate under a particular scenario. And then there's a lengthy explanation, sometimes in fine print, that say, well, there are risks involved and you will have to share some of that risk unless you're buying a, a real government bond with no other risk involved. And in order to get higher expected returns, you're gonna to have to take on some of this risk. And there's a payoff formula that's very complex saying what you get in different environments. So what did they study? The larger the headline rate, the larger in terms of correlation, the complexity in the description of what would happen and the risk that people were taking on. So for somebody with limited financial background, this is a very tough world to try to work your way through. So now I wanna to turn to some examples. Um, pension funds where individuals choose the funds they invest in come in a wide variety of different methods. The one I wanna talk about is the mandatory system in Hong Kong. I wanna talk about that because it has a very simple structure. It mandates a certain amount of earnings go to a private investment firm that is managing these regulated pension funds. And there are lots of them out there and lots of different kinds of funds. Uh, you can see the list there. And what's interesting is the Hong Kong authorities, which do a very good job of monitoring and describing what's going on and a very good job of having a website to inform you about the alternatives, report the expense ratio. The expense ratio here is in the course of a year, they will charge, and this take the first number there, 1.58% of your average balance as a charge over the course of the year. And they'll do whatever their number is year after year. And there are two things I want you to spot in this table. One is there's a wide range of difference between the lowest and the highest ones. Big difference there. And secondly, the average numbers are apart from the most conservative ones above 1% and the average even gets over 2% with some guarantees. And these numbers are all over the place. I remember when uh, there was a push in the US to switch our existing social security system, which is a pay-go system in the sense that the government accumulates the fund uh, and the government can run it up or down depending on just what's happening with the cash flows. Um, it was proposed that that change to a defined contribution system like Chile so that individuals could choose their own portfolios. And the people pushing it said, well, of course, there'll be charges for this, but say the charge is 1% a year, that's a small number, 1%. It's not a big deal. That was a refrain I came upon repeatedly. That is a misleading statement. And indeed, Hong Kong itself has recognized that uh, 
the private market doesn't compete in a way that drives down fee levels. So I did a calculation which said, let's look at what happens for somebody who has a whole career, uh, 40 years of making contributions, a fixed percentage of earnings, and earnings grow at a 2% rate for this example, but you pick any number, and you say at the end of 40 years, how much less do you have than you would have had if there were no charges, if the government were just picking up those charges. And fees in the financial sector come as front loads and come as annual management fees. And a front load, what you pay up front is what you don't have at the end, 1%, 10%, 20%, whatever it is. With an annual fee, you pay that year after year on your growing balance. And what you see is what you don't have at the end is about 20 times the size of the fee. So if you're paying a 1% fee, at the end, you've got 20% less than you would have had with a zero fee. So those numbers of 1% and 2%, that's a big hit on your accumulation. Another thing that happens, uh, not so much, not at all in the government mandated centrally run system, but in a system that is decentralized, whether mandated or not. So in Australia, people are mandated to be in a defined contribution pension system, but they're organized in a whole host of different ways. Some by the employer, some by the union, some by financial firms, and they have a problem. The problem is people switch employers and don't get around to combining their funds into a single fund. So they took a look in a recent review of the system of how many funds different people had, and only about half of them had only one. So there are two aspects here. One is it runs up the costs of the system to be handling it. The other thing is they have a problem that they get lost. People know they had another one somewhere, but they've forgotten where it was, and maybe the employer has gone out of business. So they've got a real problem in keeping track of them. Another example of the limited ability affecting the ability to look after yourself in the market. Another example comes after you've accumulated and retired, you may want or you may be forced to purchase an annuity as part of a good way of handling your money. And so in the UK, there was a time when it was mandated and that's since gone away. And the Financial Conduct Authority did a study of how well people did in buying annuities. And as you can see by the fact, they estimated that first of all, 60% of people took the annuity from the firm that was handling their accumulation and many of them I suspect without shopping around. And of the people who did that, they found 80% of them could have done better by switching. So again, we have the issue here. We're dealing with a product where the ability of people to figure out what to do was limited. Uh, it's not as severe as drugs and healthcare if we didn't have tight regulation there, but keep that example in mind in how hard it is to figure out what to do if you don't have somebody looking after you. So now I wanna to turn to a, another uh, pension fund, one in Sweden, uh, which was set up in the 90s. And it's addressing, it was set up before the Hong Kong one, but it's, a, it's addressing their recognition of the issue that the Hong Kong example shows us. They ask the question, what can we do to hold down costs? What can we do to help people make good choices? And they 
had in mind the view that people who wanted to be in the market and make choices and pick the kinds of assets that they thought made sense for themselves should have that opportunity, but people who didn't want to try to figure it out wouldn't have to and would be well looked after if they didn't. So the first thing they did is the government collected the contributions and the government did all of the record keeping rather than each fund doing them separately. And with economies of scale, that obviously lowered costs significantly. Secondly, they had a government fund <coughs> that was available to compete with private funds and provided the default. Just a political aside, to begin with, it was set up that only if you didn't respond to the request to pick a fund, did you end up in the default? You couldn't quote, choose it. I was in Stockholm when this got floated and I was chatting with some Swedish economists and I asked what they had done on this. He said, it was clear the default was better than anything else. So the first thing they did was tear up the piece of paper so they didn't send it back in by mistake. So a lot of people believed they were supposed to choose and did and discovered they weren't doing as well as if they hadn't chosen. Uh, the political pressure was such that the government said people could go to the default and overwhelmingly that's what's been happening since. But the government had the sense of what to set up for people who did want to choose and currently as in 2016, there were over 800 funds that people could choose among from over a hundred different companies. There's been some scandals, it's being reformed, uh, but let's not worry about that. I just wanna point out the role of thinking through the analysis here. So the administration cost for the government is seven basis points. A basis point is one one hundredth of a percent, very low because it's doing this record keeping and tax collecting for the funds, it says to the funds, you've got to give a reduction in your fees for people who are buying your fund through the pension compared to what you charge people coming to you in the market. How much of a deduction do they get? 49 basis points and it only cost them 0.07 based on a sense of the cost being saved for the management funds. The overall fee is 23 basis points. Um, that's for the whole system and the fees from the default, if you go in to the equity choice is 14 basis points. If you go into the fixed income, it's five basis points. Compare that with the Hong Kong numbers I've shown you and think of that 20 to one ratio. This is giving people a lot larger pensions uh, than they would have been having otherwise. So 45% of the saviors are in the default fund, 30% of the capital is because the ones who were in early, many of them haven't transferred. So on average, the funds in the default are smaller and almost every new entrant goes into the default. I wanna do one more example for you of the interesting issues that come up with pension funds and that's talking about Canada. Uh, Canada has a system, as I said at the start, um, which is a basic defined benefit plan, which is the Canada Pension Plan. Quebec has a slightly different one and the two of them uh, run in parallel. And that's the main pension plan. It's a defined benefit plan. You pay a payroll tax that started very small in the 60s uh, and slowly picked up. And to begin with, that was being used to be very generous to the early retirees which is the usual history 
when they start in the US in the 30s with social security, uh, the people who are just nearing retirement are in need. Uh, and so the system starts being generous and that's where the PAYGO logic starts. Um, since then, Canada has decided to expand in a different way, and I'll get back to that. So it's a defined benefit system. It's not aimed at being strictly PAYGO, which is just having enough money to deal with short run issues or to deal as the US did with the anticipation of the baby boomers, but it's meant to be partially funded with an idea on how to um, be fair with different cohorts. But they also have a non-contributory pension. That's something that gives money to almost everybody. Uh, and it's a flat amount, again, based on residence. So it's addressing income distribution issues within cohorts. And then it has a minimum income guarantee, which is something that's targeted specifically on poverty issues. So what's interesting in the Canadian example is that they decided to um, avoid the problem that my early slide showed you of the financial problem driving systems to need to make changes on short order. They also decided that to treat different cohorts fairly, they wanted to build up slowly a substantial fund that would cover that. So they did two things, and that's the label additional, uh, where one thing was to increase the rate, contribution rate for everybody, but the benefit coming from that increase would be on a fully funded basis. They would phase in the benefits as that accumulated. And secondly, they wanted to go further up the income distribution and again, have a tax on a part of the earnings distribution that hadn't been taxed before. And doing that meant that they would be um, doing that on a fully funded basis. So no cross cohort distribution. Obviously, if you start off by using your contributions to finance the people close to retirement, later generations are gonna pay for it if you're keeping your finances within the system. And so there's an issue of cross cohort fairness, which the Canadians decided to address by building up funding to spread the costs across different cohorts. And that would also have the effect of limiting the extent to which, as for example, in the US, we built up a very large fund. There's no plan to do anything but run it down until in another 10 to 15 years, the fund hits zero. And the only money available for US Social Security is the flow of new pension contributions, which is not enough to be paying benefits. And if there is no new legislation, everybody will get a 20% benefit cut, which for somebody long retired will be quite a shock to the system. Uh, that's not likely to happen politically, but the problem of dealing with that in short order clearly severely limits the extent you can address intercohort fairness and severely limits the ability to think it through. So what did Canada do? Um, every three years, their actuary projects for the next 75 years what's likely to happen and statistically what might happen over a range. And in addition to looking at whether there's enough money to pay benefits for 75 years, they look at the question 
of whether the ratio of the size of the fund to a year's expenditures is as large in 60 years as it's projected to be in 10 years. So that's a inter-cohort fairness measure that they're looking at. And they've set up this funding to be handled by an independent board. So the politicians are not involved in the investment decisions and the Canadian pension plan investments look like a typical sovereign wealth fund. They're into every type of asset all around the world. So what happens when the actuary makes that calculation? The actuary may find, as happened with the most recent study, uh, that the current contribution rate is large enough to cover the base plan. They've got new rules coming in for the additional plan, but they haven't been fully sorted out yet, and they're complex. So I want to keep this as an example of something to think about in a simple case. The, um, if the contribution rate is not large enough, then there's a window for the government to do something about it. The actual politics of that are a bit complex because Canada takes its federalism very seriously and the management of the pension plan is a joint federal and provincial combination. And that leads to complications on what it takes to make changes. So if there's an agreement between the federal and provincial finance ministers and something addresses the shortfall, that takes care of it. If there isn't, then there's an automatic element that kicks in. The contribution rate is increased to cover half the gap between the actual contribution rate and what would be needed on a 75 year basis. And the cost of living adjustments annually will not happen for the next three years. So as analysts, we can say, how is this problem being addressed? Uh, there is a literature that does stochastic simulation of the whole and asking the question of what happens over time when this might be invoked repeatedly, what happens over time to the different individuals. If it comes back not needing further need, uh, the workers in that three-year window have paid slightly higher contributions and get no additional benefits for that. The retirees who didn't get their cost of living adjustments, so it's not the new retirees, um, not only didn't get them in those years, but since the cost of living adjustment is an increase on the previous year's benefits, they will have lower benefits for the rest of their lives. In addition, the size of the benefit cut is obviously very sensitive to the level of inflation, which seems like a rather arbitrary measure. Although politically we can all understand the public is very averse to nominal benefit cuts. And Sweden had a big public backlash when its first automatic adjustment uh, led to large nominal benefit cuts. So the idea that they're going to recognize um, behavioral economics and sensitivity uh, to nominal as well as real phenomena, uh, money illusion in terms of behavioral economics vocabulary is understandable, but I think they could have done better than that. So laying out uh, the kinds of issues around the two things I've talked about and a whole lot more uh, are part of what Nick Barr and I have been working about. And part of
Peter, you're frozen, I think. for a couple of seconds to see if uh -oh. okay I, I imagine what he's doing is logging off and logging in again oh uh, yeah oh, our speaker just disappeared <laughs> i was gonna say good good timing that was his last slide yeah yeah, we're about to uh, get into Q&A as well.